Um, what I thought we'd do today is uh, my session is just a little bit of a recap about TechEd, point out some things to you that maybe you missed or weren't aware of, um, and really open things up for questions as, as much as anything. Um, I hope there are some good questions from the audience, you know, follow-up questions from things that you saw at TechEd, uh, particularly developer-related things, since that's, that's what I cover. Um, but uh, here to, uh, to help with any, any follow-up that you might have. But, but I thought I, I'd start with a little bit of an overview, and I'll use a couple things as, as examples. I mean, obviously, TechEd was really different this year, um, as the whole year has been has been di different. Certainly, um, the the most obvious thing is we we took the entire event online, and it was it was uh, free of charge and enabled us to reach a much larger audience than ever before. So I hope much of the audience on the call today has had a chance to join in for some of the content live or um, even now so much of the content is still available. And that's really one of the things that I wanted to point out today is that you can still go out uh, either to the TechEd platform um, and, it, and you can still register for the event even though the, the initial live section is over. A great many of the of the lectures and the main content from Channel One, the keynotes, and all those sort of things are all available for replay. Uh, but you can also rewatch them in other places as well. For instance, if you go to, um, if you prefer, you can just go to uh, to YouTube and. Uh, like you can go to the SAP developer channel on YouTube. And if you look at our most recent videos, you'll see that a lot of the content from, oh, tell you what, let's, <laughs> a lot of the content from, uh, from TechEd is, is all available here. It's, it's split between the SAP TechEd channel on YouTube, the SAP community channel and the SAP developers channel. But for instance, if you are a developer, I think you'll find most of the developer related content um, is, is here on the SAP developers channel on YouTube. Uh, so available for you to watch. Like I said, even if you don't want to log into the page, we, we try to make it as accessible as possible on, on social media as well. Um, you know, following along with that, one of the major differences that we had this year was taking all the hands-on workshops and making uh, making the content for them available in uh, the SAP samples repository on GitHub. So you, you might not realize this, but if you just come to github.com and go to the SAP samples, sap-samples org, and you search for uh, TechEd, uh, 2020, because all the repositories start with the name TechEd 2020, um, then you'll find you know, 61 repositories here matching up to all the various hands-on workshops. Um, you know, we weren't exactly sure how to do workshops. If you've ever been to TechEd in person, you know, you know, you walk into a room and we've, we've already pre-configured and set up a bunch of laptops that are sitting there and they're ready for you to sit down and do the exercises. Obviously we couldn't just provide desktop images even in the cloud um, at, at scale uh, like that. We, you know, we looked into it, uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't really feasible. Uh, so for many workshops, we switched over to uh, trying to base them on the trial software so that you can do the exercises without needing a whole lot of extra things installed or needing a license or, or anything like that. And um, so a great many of the workshops, even if you weren't able to join in person during TechEd, they're very doable on, on your own. And, and I've used my own workshop here as an example. I'll, I'll walk through it real quick. Now, not every workshop is doable on the trial. Not every workshop necessarily has all the things that I'm gonna show you here. Uh, but, but one thing that, that many workshops tried to do, you know, for instance, I recorded videos of, of the entire workshop, including the, the opening lecture, uh, all the prerequisites and, and every exercise it, in here also has, has a video to, to walk you through that particular exercise. They all just, uh, in this example, they all open on YouTube and uh, will walk you through, through the exercise. Um, 
most exercise documents I think you'll find are extremely step-by-step. -step. You know, they show you exactly what to click on and they uh, hopefully explain to you why you're clicking on those things, what the different things mean. So, you know, even if you aren't able to necessarily do all the exercises on your own, if, if not all of them maybe are, are you know, able to do on the trial software, I think there's a lot of value of just the fact that all the steps and, and all the instructions are available here in GitHub for everybody to, to view and walk through. Um, so I would encourage you to, you know, when you have some time, you know, pick out some topics that you're interested in learning and, and come out here and check out the, the exercises. But, you know, the example I'm giving you here, this was all designed so that you can do it on your own. It's all based upon the free trial. There, there are steps here that walk you through how to get set up on the trial, how to get set up in the business application studio, how to get set up with SAP HANA Cloud on the trial, because this particular workshop does use HANA Cloud as well, and, and then takes you through the, through the steps of building an application in this case. The other thing that we're trying to do is we know many people will do the exercises after the fact, and we still wanted to give you a way to be able to reach out and, and get support. So you can just use the issues functionality in GitHub. Um, you know, go to the issues tab and, and if you've got a question or you've got a problem doing the exercises, then go ahead and, and create an issue. And that allows us to be able to help you out you know, asynchronously, we, we're not online the whole time, uh, you know, now that tech it is over, we, we can't answer your questions interactively, but uh, the session owners are happy to support you after the fact, um, going through the exercises on your own. Like this repository we've had, we've had two different uh, questions asked. Uh, one actually uh, required us to, um, to make a code change in, in on a cloud itself. There, there, there was a bug that was found. Um, we had to report it back to development. It took a, a few days to get it fixed, but but we were able to, um, you know, or if you just have a question about something going on in one of the exercises, um, you know, you're, you're not totally on your own here uh, doing the exercises. Uh, so I encourage you to check those out. Like I said, just go to SAP samples, come down here and search for TechEd 2020, and you'll find all the, all the various uh, resources or you can go to the, uh, if, you, if you're signed up, you can go to the sessions and uh, search, say you find one that you want to join or check out, T160, I'll use mine as an example again. And uh, when you come in here, even though it says session ended, if you should have a link to uh, all the hands-ons uh, workshops will have a link down here. And if you click on that, that's just going to take you back to the GitHub repository as well. So different ways to find your way to, to the content there uh, to explore it after the fact. The other thing that I wanted to talk about today was, and I hope maybe everybody had a chance to check it out. And that was something new that we did this year that, that my team built and delivered which was a special developer keynote. And this was um, this is a really great opportunity for us to be able to deliver uh, a really a detailed uh, message here to, to so many eyes. It was a keynote. It was shown at a time when there was no other content going on at TechEd. It was an all eyes activity. Um, you know, we, we did have, oh, uh, Tens of thousands of people watch the developer keynote, so it was great for us. Um, but I hope uh, everybody in, enjoyed it, first of all. But we really wanted to tell the typical story of building an application in this modern era using the cloud, using side by side extensibility for S4. In, in, in our instance, we, we started with the scenario that we wanted to that our company this fake company that that uh, our three developers were working at that they um they have an s4 hana cloud system and they needed it to do an extension for part of the sales order processing and it was you know it's a made-up scenario you know, we we kind of knew what technologies we wanted to do and then we worked backwards into the scenario um and it's maybe a little bit 
of a simplistic scenario. Some people pointed out, well, you could use pricing conditions or something like that to, to do the same sort of thing. But we wanted a, a business scenario that made sense, but, but also was easy enough for everyone to understand, even if you were maybe an S4 expert or um, uh, an SD expert or something like that. So we kept it, we kept the business scenario rather simple. When, when new orders are captured, we wanted to take the order value, use it to calculate credits based upon how much you're spending and use those credits to plant trees uh, in, in, in this particular scenario. Uh, but we wanted to show how different developers uh, that come from different backgrounds and have different skill sets can still work together on one project. And yes, we combined a lot of different technologies. You know, we had one developer who was a, a CAP developer who uses the cloud application programming model, specifically Node.js. We had another developer who was a traditional ABOP developer and, and they were developing on, on Steampunk, the ABOP in the cloud platform using the RAP, the RESTful, uh, RESTful application programming model uh, for the ABOP environment. And then we had a third developer who was coming from outside the SAP ecosystem, who was a, you know, a cloud native developer who came into this knowing how, you know, they, they use Google Go on a daily basis and they were used to deploying onto Kubernetes. Um, and they didn't know anything about the SAP world. They, they just needed to know how to uh, expose their service and have it called and, and do this calculation and pass the data back. And then of course we put a, a Fiori UI5 UI on top of all this. And it wasn't so much to say that every project needs to contain all these technologies, but to show that developers with different backgrounds coming from these different technologies can still work together and create one unified application. That it isn't that you have to choose a single technology to do your entire application in, if that's not what you wanna do. We wanted to show the openness to the outside that, that you know, non-traditional SAP developers can, uh, companies can come in and be part of the project as well and, and provide technical components and they can work into the overall application. We wanted to show that ABOP developers can write cloud native applications and, and, and services as well and integrate into a completely cloud native uh, uh, application flow as well. And we wanted to show that all these pieces can fit together they don't have to be hardwired together. They, the developers from one technology don't have to know all that much about the other technologies, but we can seamlessly exchange data and events using enterprise messaging and by web service calls, OData. Uh, you know, so every, everything here that connects these dots, it's all API hub exposing the, you know, helping us document the services from the S4 HANA cloud, OData services being consumed both by the cloud application programming model and the RESTful application programming model. The enterprise messaging boss allows us to exchange the data and events between all these things, including S4, because when new sales orders are created, we're not having to pull for them. We're, we're getting them as events raised by the S4 system that triggers our, our custom flow. And I think most importantly is how we persisted the data at the ABOP level because we did not use a Z table and, and just write the data back into um, uh, say the, the ABOP system as we, we might all um, be used to from, from the past. We kept things very clean. We, we persisted the data separately in the steampunk system, but we didn't persist any data that was already available in the S4 system. So for instance, we only persisted the credits and then the keys uh, to the customer that they belong to, but all the rest of the data about the, about the business partner, about the customer was retrieved dynamically by calling that OData service from the S4 system. Yet we surfaced one OData service from the ABOP layer. And, and from the front end, you wouldn't know that you were actually talking to multiple systems here. We used virtual elements and a remote service consumption within the wrap service so that there was a single endpoint coming out of the ABOP system that the front end could consume. 
And part of that data from that service was coming from the local persistence of the steampunk system. And part of it was, was being passed through from the cap layer that coming from the messaging bus. And part of it was uh, being retrieved in real time from the S4 system. And I think that's really where we've got to get to, to be very successful with this idea of keep the core clean and side-by-side -side extensibility, all these things that SAP has been talking about for a number of years. Um, that's absolutely critical, particularly when you start doing S4 HANA in the cloud, where you can't just go in and start writing ABOP code and create your own Z programs and Z tables and stuff like that, because it is a managed and perhaps multi-tenant environment. Uh, the ability to do that cleanly in a side-by-side -side scenario, but rather easily, you know, with wizards that, that allow you to remotely connect to the backend service, RFC or, or OData, generate proxies in that, that ABOP side-by-side -side or that sidecar system, and then have singular services that come out of that, that, that simplify the consumption. Um, that's, that's a really important part of, of this story. Um, so in addition to the, to, to the little bit of overview that, uh, that I gave you here, I, I encourage you to check out the, um, the developer keynote. If you haven't already watched it, of course, it's available on replay. We have a little bit of fun with it as well. Um, it is, uh, no slides. The, the only slide, if you will, in the, in the presentation is this, uh, architectural whiteboard diagram that you see here. Otherwise it's three developers walking through the code and explaining the code to you. And you know, the other thing I wanna point out is all the source code for all this is also available here on, on GitHub. We published um, uh, you know, all the source code. So you see something, a lot of times I think people, you know, hopefully watch something like this keynote and it plants the seed of the idea. And then six months down the line, maybe they're on a project and, and, and that reconnects and it goes, oh, I remember seeing that in the keynote that could be a, a solution to my problem. Well, you have the ability to come back out here now, six months down the line or whenever, and then really deeply study the source code behind all these things. You know, if you, if you wanna come in here and say, oh, you know, I remember how the, how the wrap stuff worked. Uh, I, I want to uh, see more. Well, that was a wrap receiver. Let's uh, uh, the, uh, go into the ABOP folder. Uh, you know, and then you've got, uh, you know, all the source code that you can pull into a system. Uh, we tried to make it so that you could take the entire project and recreate it using only trial systems. We've got documentation here on each of the layers and, and what it takes to set them up uh, from, from a deployment standpoint, from a security standpoint. We tried to, to walk you through, if you were building this from scratch yourself, what you would need to do, where you need to insert keys and, and authorization and things like that. Uh, so it's more than just the keynote explaining to you from a high level what this can do but you know we tried to really make this available for for deep learning here as well uh, the other thing that we did is if you want we even uh, uh, exposed the whole thing we we created docker images for all the components as well and they're published here in in github and ready to be pulled into your own environment if you want to try them out uh, play around with them, uh, uh, you know, they're readily available here as well. And for the most part, we, oh, I went too far back. Uh, we tried to add instructions um, of how to deploy this both to Kima, Kubernetes, and to Cloud Foundry. Uh, but I think you'll see is, is most of the time as we were testing it, we were, um, we were actually testing locally on, on our local development machines for the most part, not the ABOP part. We were using a steampunk uh, trial system uh, to the, do that testing, but the Go and the Cap parts and uh, the Fury, we, we were mostly testing locally on, on our local development machines and, and mostly using VS Code for that. Uh, but we tried to put instructions in here for, for all the various uh, scenarios and different IDEs that you might use uh, to, to work on this. So with that, that was my overview of some of the content, particularly for developers that we had at TechEd um, and a high level bit about TechEd itself. Kind of hoping at this point, there might be 
questions from the audience, follow up from any of the sessions that you saw. Maybe, you know, you went to some of the keynotes, you got questions about positioning of anything or, or follow up questions about something you saw. Now's, now's really your chance to ask any of those questions. Um, so I don't know how you guys have been handling questions on previous sessions. If people can come off mute and ask them, or if they use the question and answer pod in, in zoom or ask them in the chat or however we want to do them. But, uh, basically I was hoping for most of the rest of this time, um, answer any questions that you might have. And everyone's completely quiet now. Sorusu olan varsa arkadaşlar el kaldırarak sorabilirsiniz. Ee, sorry for Turkish. No problem. I just explained how they can ask the questions on uh, Zoom. Ee, QA'ya da yazabilirsiniz. Maybe I can start with one uh -huh, question. Sure. <coughs> uh, I'm, I was just wondering, uh, when we use the Steampunk uh, for uh, developments on the ABAP site, and uh, you said you persistent all data to the, uh, on the S4 system. When mm -hmm. we should uh, think about uh, persist data on, I mean, uh, if I have some scenario and I, I need some developments on this, but uh, I, I, I will have an option to persist some data on the ABAP system or on directly use the S S4 system. Can you explain the differences, uh, advantages or disadvantages? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course you, you would persist any data that's part of the standard S4 data model back in the S4 system, whether that's cloud or on-premise. But think about any time today in a project where if, if you're talking about a, an ERP system in jet, you know, business suite or, or S4 on-premise, where you might create a Z table or Z fields right, where you're doing extension, particularly Z tables, where, where you're maybe creating your own data model, but, but even those additional customer specific fields, depending upon whether you're using S4 HANA Cloud or depending upon how strictly you wanna say you wanna keep the core clean, you may not wanna persist that in the S4 system itself. Um, the idea that in order to extend the data model with, uh, with customer specific fields that we have to go in and literally, you know, add fields to the SAP delivered tables. That's what we've done for years. Yes. In the ABAP world. But what we're saying here with this approach is that that's not necessarily what we want to do moving forward. Instead, think of it as more of a distributed data model that it isn't even that that all the data has to live in the same database, right? So as we did in the developer keynote, we took the business partner scenario and we added customer specific fields, but we persisted those using wrap in Steampunk, in completely separate instance uh, of, 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 of data model and database, but it's one unified data model to the outside. Any, anyone consuming that OData service wouldn't know, you know, they're calling the business partner service and they're getting those additional fields. They don't realize that it passed through the, the steampunk layer and it called the original API business partner from the S4 backend and then enhanced the results with additional fields from its local persistence. And the outside world doesn't need to know that level of complexity. It just knows it's calling a business partner API, but, but unlike the old days where we would have added Z fields, append structures or whatever to the original data model, we we're not touching the original data model. It's, it's completely uh, separate here. We're only persisting the, the keys of the, of whatever business object that we're working with. And then our additional customer fields, um, our uh, customer specific fields here in this, in this separate data model. And, you know, another announcement from the keynote at TechEd was the idea that for S4 HANA Cloud, we're going to offer an embedded Steampunk, right? So you won't even have to go get that separate Steampunk instance. It will just be part of this, this existing S4 system. And uh, what we'll see there is, you know, technically that may even be a single HANA instance underneath there. And they may be separated by 
by separate schemas. Um, you know, they may still somewhat uh, be separated, but but uh, a single instance. But you know, this allows you the ability to. Uh, well, first of all, it allows us to uh, do this in a multi-tenant way, or or allow partners to deliver enhancements uh, that that can be activated for only a single tenant as well. Um, it's because we're not changing the original data model. You know, that's the problem with taking the append approach is is how do you then keep that if you're actually changing the data model short of either replicating the data model for for each tenant or or somehow having just logic to separate it you know if checks at the application server level how do you truly keep those those additions separate and private to only one tenant if if you have a shared data model well this approach it allows uh, a single clean uh, original data model for all tenants. And then because it's physically separate, any customer specific or partner specific enhancements to the data model, those can only, those, you can allow that to only be accessed and exposed for the particular tenants that, that, that you want. So it's a very different way of thinking. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we have another question in the uh, QA part. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, so I, I'll, I'll just read it here aloud. It, the aim of architecture is gathering around all the developers in their own areas and trying to make them develop in common projects, isn't it? If I understood, um, please correct me. Well, I mean, the aim of this architecture is to make it possible to plug in developers with different backgrounds without forcing them all to relearn and move to a single, um, a single programming model or a single language or a single set of tools simply to have a unified architecture. What we have here in this example is we have different technologies. We have CAP and we have RAP and we've got components from, from outside the SAP ecosystem but they all work as one unified architecture. Uh, so it isn't, about, it isn't about saying that you have to have all these different technologies. It's about having the option to be able to combine together all these different technologies when you need to. And if you have resource problems, you know, you, you, you can't find, you know, whatever, you, you can't find the latest ABAP resources out there in the world, but uh, but you can find people who know JavaScript or vice versa. You can plug those people into the project without having to spend a lot of time upskilling them. And I think this is particularly important to growing the SAP ecosystem is making it accessible to the non-traditional SAP developer that you don't have to go through a six month boot camp and learn all of the SAP terminology proprietary technologies and things like that to be able to contribute to an SAP application or extension is that by using standards like OData, like RESTful services, like enterprise messaging, which is based upon standard pub sub uh, technology and concepts, someone can plug into this, plug in and be a part of your architecture without having to do um, a whole reskilling, upskilling kind of exercise. Hopefully that, that addressed your, your question. I see there's a, another question here. I'll go ahead and grab it from the uh, question and answer pod. Um, understand that steampunk is just a runtime. By persistency in steampunk, I think you mean persistency on HANA DB on SAP Cloud. Um, well, when you get a steampunk system today, if you go provision a steampunk system, it's, it of course uses HANA as its persistency, but it's got a built in HANA instance. It, it isn't like you can just, uh, or, or that you have to also go provision HANA cloud and connect it to your steampunk system. When you get a steampunk instance, it, it has that persistency underneath it, right? Uh, so I'm when I'm saying steampunk, I, I, I'm really referring to the ABAP application server and ABAP runtime 
and ABAP data dictionary and all those things that you're familiar with. And just like a, a non-premise ABAP system, there is an already supplied and, and uh, delivered HANA system underneath that uh, because, well, an ABAP system can't function without that persistence. So we, we, you know, we store a source code and repository still in the underlying database and, and ABAP and the underlying database have always been commingled and, and that's no different with steampunk and certainly no different with, with um, steampunk in, in that it still has that commingling and that you don't have to connect it up to an external HANA system. It comes with its own HANA persistence already built in. So hopefully that, that clarified that for you. Okay. Other questions? Uh, I may have a question, actually, if that's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, Thomas, first of all, it's uh, great to have you here. Uh, in the sessions, I mean, in the uh, sub inside track uh, Turkey sessions in the previous years, and also in our uh, private uh, chat sessions, we always uh, come, I mean, uh, go around and come back to the same question. And I would like to uh, hear your opinion about it, actually. The okay. thing is, now we have all these, you know, new technologies, uh, mostly on the cloud. So uh, as a Python developer, you can be on the cloud. Uh, that's very natural, you know. Um, but as an ABAP developer, uh, the cloud is uh, relatively new, actually. But uh, the cloud costs of uh, ABAP development on the cloud is uh, significantly higher than uh, the alternatives. So for instance, uh, if I want to, you know, um, develop a simple service on Python and host it on uh, Amazon Web Services or Heroku or whatnot, I can start with a very uh, reasonable price to host my solution. But when I go to the sub cloud platform, I mean, the uh, price difference is huge. And for example, uh, especially in Turkey, uh, when we go to a client and we, you know, um, attempt to, uh, you know, tell them that a solution should be on the cloud. The first roadblock we get is this price. And most of the time, I mean, we spend hours uh, studying the materials that you showed us. For example, uh, we do a lot on trials and, you know, uh, develop our skills in our dojo, so to say. But when we go to the real life, um, not always, of course, there are uh, big companies and whatnot, but most often than not, we get this roadblock of the costs on the cloud is simply too expensive for many companies, especially in, uh, you know, in our country, maybe, or at least uh, that's my experience. I would like uh, to hear your opinion about this roadblock and uh, how can this be passed, so to say, you know. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts there. Um, first of all, it's, it's easy for all of us to have when it comes to cost to have a short term um, view of it. And, and when you do that, particularly with things that we're talking about here, like side by side extensibility or, or moving to the cloud, sometimes you look at it compared to the sunk cost of having your already existing system you know, you already have the hardware or something like that. And you're like, oh, I could just drop into it and start writing Z code, right? And if you compare that to the startup cost of, of provisioning a system in the cloud, it's, it's you know, that's, that's hard to, to, to compete with, right? You have to take a longer term view of things though. And you have to look at the cost of ownership over time, uh, how difficult or costly it is to apply maintenance and, and upgrades to your core systems and what, side-by-side -side extensibility and putting those things in the cloud can free you up to do. Um, the, the access that gives you to new features that are gonna come along. The fact that when you move to the cloud, these are managed systems, which means you no longer are having to supply the, the admin people to do things like regular maintenance and updates and, and OS patches and things like that. That is built into the cost of these services, particularly when you compare them to 
on premise where we're, you know, yes, there's a, a set cost of, to provide the hardware in the system, but then there's people cost to, to maintaining those things as well. And you have to factor, factor that in. Now, that said, you know, you gave the example of like, oh, deploying a Python service on AWS, compare that to deploying an ABOP service. That is, yeah, that's apples and oranges to some extent comparison, right? Because I can take a Python service, or I'll come back to it here in a second, a CAP service, a Node.js Java service, and I can deploy it on the cloud platform or on AWS or on Google Cloud, and I can provision just the resources that I need. You know, a, a, a typical CAP service might be one gig of memory, right? One, one virtual CPU, one gig of memory, and, and run it in a container, and that literally can be you know, pennies a day to run that. But if I start then deploying a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth service, of course, those, those compute costs start to add up, right? So a single microservice compared to an ABOP system, which is not microservice based, is always going to have a hard cost comparison. But the idea of doing ABOP is you invest in a single cloud instance. And if you only put one service on it, yeah, that's gonna be overkill, right? Because the minimal sizing for an ABOP system is large enough to run many, many services and, and service many users, you know? So it, it doesn't scale all the way down as far as a microservice uh, directly on a hyperscaler using another, uh, another approach. But on the other hand, as you begin to deploy more and more services into that environment, scaling up no longer costs you nearly as much, right? Because you have a single instance, uh, you have a lot of built-in capacity there. So if you're preparing to deploy a large number of services over a, a, a period of time, that's where it becomes very cost effective. But if you're doing a one-to-one, -one, I've got a single service to deploy and I'm trying to compare the cost between, you know, as you, uh, you using your particular example, Python on AWS, compare that to ABOP Steampunk, that's never going to economically work out. Uh, you know, and then, and then the higher cost of the persistence having to be HANA underneath that, um, you know, has, has baked in uh, costs there from a hardware standpoint, because we're running in memory. But then once again, the, the performance benefits and things like that. But that's where I think having the choice of these two, I mean, yes, we, we wanna make it open so you can bring your development skills, but I still encourage ABOP developers to learn CAP and vice versa, because CAP, when you have that, when you have that scenario where the customer says, I just wanna deploy one service on the cloud and I only need you know, 100 users right now, down the road, I might scale it higher, but I, but I need to do this. I need it to interact with the rest of the SAP ecosystem, but, but I, I'm only concerned with the cost of deploying this one service. That's where CAP is a much better option because you can build that single, either Node.js or, um, uh, or Java-based service, deploy it as a microservice. You can use persistency of HANA, or, or now we're seeing through community contributions, Postgres for your persistency as well. You have a wide range of, of cost starting points there. You can deploy it to the cloud platform or you can deploy it directly to the hyperscaler if, if that better meets the customer's, um, uh, the customer's requirements. Um, you could, you could deploy it to the hyperscaler and use the identity services of the cloud platform, you know, and not, and not split your, your identity authentication management as well. You have a wide range of options that's gonna put you in a much more competitive scenario uh, from a cost standpoint, if that's the scope of what the customer is, is looking for. And I think having the options of either of those, yet both environments meeting enterprise requirements of multi-language, um, you know, supportability, uh, you know, all the things that we ex expect from in the enterprise world and over time being able to grow and, 
and and combine it together between these two, that's that's where the value comes. Yeah, thanks. That's a very good uh, and detailed question. So maybe we can sum it up for everyone. Like, uh, technology is of course not the only factor of such a decision. We have, like you said, a developer skills is a factor. Uh, technology is obviously a factor. Cost is a factor. So the trick is maybe there are two tricks to be involved here. One to find the best long-term solution for the, uh, the clients. That's for sure. Uh, and maybe in some cases, my very simplistic example of a simple Python service is the, maybe is the right answer in some cases. But looking long term, this uh, seemingly high cost is maybe the right answer for this client. But that's only the first question. The second uh, point would be maybe that's also uh, something I could ask uh, quickly if I'm allowed to ask two questions. There are so many technologies available. I mean, uh, and for example, a client has a problem. Maybe I can think of five different ways to solve it. Mm -hmm. One of yeah. them is subcloud platform, one of them is whatever. But the thing is, we only have 24 hours in a day and uh, it's getting harder and harder to be an expert on everything. So us developers need to be clever about where to focus and where to ignore, you know? Uh, and maybe that's a tough question because uh, nobody can predict the future 100%. And when predicting the futures, I mean, when trying to decide where to invest our own time as developers, we also have to consider how much money does the client have and you know, which uh, technologies or which solutions is the client going to uh, prefer? You know, if I foresee that uh, in the upcoming five or 10 years, I won't find any clients uh, willing to pay for those high costs on the cloud. I'm not saying that they won't, it's just, I'm just making this up. Then maybe it's wiser for me to invest my time in another area. But if I see clients who are uh, willing to uh, invest uh, here, then I will have to invest my own developer time, you know, my own dojo time, so to say, in this, uh, in the other direction. So what is your about, uh, opinion about this uh, dilemma of investing our personal time in uh, self-development as developers? Well, I think that's, <laughs> come back to my, <laughs> the, the, my go-to two run times here of, of ABAP with RAP and, and CAP is that, these are both things, I mean, SAP is very intentional about our own investment choices here, right? We're, while we allow plugging in things completely from outside the ecosystem as Python or Go or something like that, there's a pretty intentional investment here in what's underneath CAP and what's underneath RAP, obviously, and that they are easier on ramps from our existing customer base. I mean, obviously, uh, ABOP, Steampunk, RAP being ABOP based, um, easier on ramp. Uh, CAP being available in both Node and Java, those are already technologies that have good, good foothold in the SAP ecosystem. And then both of these technologies, both these programming models have support on premise as well. If you learn RAP, this is something you can also use in S4 systems on premise. And it continues to leverage the existing ABAP skills that, that you likely already have if you're interested in RAP. Likewise, CAP can be deployed on premise as well. We, we try to, with, with both these technologies, provide programming models that that allow you to tap into cloud native qualities and, and elastic qualities when you deploy them in the cloud, but both are deployable and usable in the on-premise world as well. I can take CAP applications. Well, I, I mean, you can run them on, on HANA XSA as well, but I can take a CAP application and I can stand up a, a commodity server in my data center on premise, uh, you know, Windows server, a Linux, uh, you know, Suzy, um, Ubuntu, whatever. And I can run a cap application there. I, I don't need the whole cloud platform to deploy a cap application. I can then take that same cap application and deploy it to the cloud platform or deploy it on a hyperscaler. And it's going to then be able to take advantage of some of those things that are provided specifically in the cloud 
or take advantage of the different security models that are available there. So I think looking where SAP, our, our two proposed programming models, if I'm a developer and I'm straddling that on-premise cloud world, I think I might have requirements for the cloud in the future, but I don't yet. I would invest my education in these two, right? As, as programming models is where I grow because there's gonna be opportunities to, to leverage these in the on-premise world today and you're well preparing yourself. I think it's inevitable that the cloud is the future uh, for, for most any companies, but everybody's gonna, everybody's gonna make that, that move at, at a different pace and a different time. But I think you're, you're preparing yourself well to be able to operate in both of those worlds. Uh, thank you for your answer. And uh, actually, maybe I should repeat this for everyone. So uh, uh, CAP and RAP uh, are the points that would maybe, you know, uh, bring the maximum output with the minimum investment of time, maybe. I mean, I invest maybe uh, one hour and then get, you know, 10 hours of uh, development a business back, maybe. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's maybe more than an hour initial investment uh, to, yeah, to the learning curve. But the idea is that both of them, as I said, have hopefully easy on-ramps from the existing SAP ecosystem skill set. They were designed with the starting point of our current developer base in mind, rather than starting from scratch with, with a programming model coming from, from the outside world. Okay, thank you, uh, Thomas. This was very enlightening. Uh, your both uh, answers were very enlightening. Thank you very much. And I would yep. like to you know, leave some space for others for further questions. So uh, I pass the microphone. <laughs> Okay. okay. There's a there's a question here in the uh, in the Q and A pod. I see. Do, do you think terminal is the future for devs? Well, I'm, did 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 uh, did my colleague DJ put you up to asking that question? <laughs> <laughs> DJ's DJ's always preaching that the future uh, the is terminal, right? Um, I don't think it's the only future, right? Um, I mean, um, I like, I like terminal as well. I, I like the idea of what it, what it means, right? Cause we made, a, as an industry, we, you know, there's always a pendulum, right? Of, of how extreme things get. And if I look at like some of the development tools that, that I've interacted with the last couple of years, whether it's like the HANA studio or the web IDE, Powerful tools, but can be frustrating. And, and I'll give you my view as, a, as I used to be the, the product manager for those. Always frustrated by the idea that there was functionality that already existed in the programming model or the language. You know, we would introduce some new SQL syntax or SQL script or something like that. And you couldn't use it yet as a developer because it hadn't been coded into the IDE. You know, sometimes we're just waiting on somebody to add a menu option to the IDE in order to be able to do something. And sometimes there would be a, a lag of, of, of an entire release cycle before, you know, from the time the, the feature was produced and the time that it was usable because of that, that separation. And to me, what if we now compare this to where we are with Visual Studio Code or the Business Application Studio and the fact that yes, there's an IDE and there's menus and wizards, but everything I can do can also be done in a cloud shell or, or a local shell using a terminal interface. That means as soon as those features are added, they're immediately accessible. And it means not just that they're accessible, that now I can write my own little scripts. I wanna go beyond, I wanna combine two or three commands together I start writing scripts of my own. I start writing a command line utility because it, that's a real, pardon me, a really accessible user interface for me as a developer. I can start enhancing my own IDE using the terminal and that's really powerful. And I've experienced that myself, you know. Um, I invested a lot of time in, in starting to write little command line scripts to help with HANA and then I turned it into a little uh, command utility 
uh, you know, because it was so accessible, I didn't need to learn the UI framework of the web IDE in order to do that. I, you know, I, I didn't have to invest in a particular technology. The command line is the command line. It, you know, it works in a shell, it works, um, works in Linux, works in Windows, works in Mac, and, and you don't have to deal with differentiation there and, and, and things like that. So it's, it's that low barrier to entry to being able to, to not only use it, but also enhance it and, and, and bring things together. That's, um, that's the real benefit that, that I see there. Um, and I don't know, like I said, it's a pendulum swing, right? I don't know if it's so much a changing nature of the industry as we kind of swing back to that. You know, we go too far one extreme of, of oh, everything's got to be in the GUI. And that makes it, that does make it very accessible to people who are new. And you don't have to, when you're a new programmer in an environment, if you have to learn a manuals full of uh, archaic uh, command line commands, that can be very intimidating. But on the other hand, you take away the ability for an experienced developer to use those commands and the IDE or the development environment all of a sudden has less value to them. And finding that, that right spot in the, in the pendulum swing where both parties, both personas are served, both by a good graphical user interface that guides particularly the new user in the environment and the powerful uh, professional expert capabilities that you can begin to uh, really do your own thing that, that the terminal kind of interface provides um, that sweet spot is having both in, in my mind. So hopefully that, uh, that answers that question. What else we have here? Uh, Thanks for the great tech head recap and further answers. What do we, what do you see as the most demanding demanded technology in SAP customer projects nowadays? Uh, for developers, the most demanded technology still ABOP, right? Um, because the uh, the SAP ecosystem is still dominated by ERP S four um, and its satellite components that are ABOP based and ABOP remains the lifeblood of, of enhancing those kinds of projects. But on the, not on the peripheral, but, but around there, I mean, that's, that's always going to be our core business, right? Is ERP. Everything comes back to ERP, but surrounding that there's so much more to what SAP offers and what our customers do on projects than just the ERP world. And you have to look at those different, different areas, you know, whether it's big data, data lake, data analytics, and things like that. And they're absolutely, you know, HANA and HANA skills are, are very dominant. Or, or you talk about user interface technology, whether that's sitting on top of ERP or other applications, um, UI5, Fiori, uh, being able to tie in mobility into that. I mean, there's, there's just different technologies for, for all those different use cases. You know, to say one is dominant because it can be used by all is, is not the case. I mean, ABOP is dominant because it remains the best tool for developers to extend ERP and, and the S4 world. And, and that's the dominant overall conversation just because every, most everybody in the SAP customer base uses that at its core. But there are so many other solutions and then there are, there are dominant technologies that support those other, other solutions. So I, by no means do, a, do would I imply that OPOP is the um, end all be all technology that, that serves all SAP uh, customer needs across all applications. Um, it's increasingly important as developers to have a rich toolbox. Um, if you, only specialize in op op for instance and i have to pick on that again but if and and you aren't venturing out into other things and being able to also do some fury ui5 development and be able to do some cap development and some hana native development and know something about you know, all these other things that are out there whether it's mobile development or cloud-based development you you've got to be very well rounded these days as a developer um 
years ago when I was working in the ERP world, you could, you could make a good living being a hundred percent only ABOP developer and, and basically close yourself off to the rest of the industry and other programming languages. I, I, I just don't think that that's feasible in this world anymore. You have to, you have to have a mixture of tools in your toolbox to, to augment that, that ABOP tool. Okay, I know we're we're nearly at the top of the hour, so I want to be mindful of of other presenters and topics that are coming. Uh, so so maybe I'll I'll pause here and uh, and turn back over to the to the moderators to see how uh, if uh, now's a good time to wrap up or. Exciting. So uh, we greatly appreciate your session, Thomas, uh, and the highlights about uh, TechEd. We are thankful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for letting me be a part of your uh, your inside track. Uh, 